coming up on this episode of Crime Family. So for true crime followers, Lacey Peterson has been a household name for over 20 years. Her murder grabbed the attention of the U.S. and really the world on Christmas Eve 2002. Ron Gransky, who was Lacey's stepfather, called 911 to report Lacey missing. He said that Lacey had been out for a walk with her dog, but the dog returned home without Lacey. Hey, beautiful. I just left a message at home. Uh, 2.15. That doesn't make any sense to me. Like, it's too cold to go golfing. But yet, out in the middle of the ocean, it's going to be warmer? Yeah, it is crazy that they turned on him so quickly. But like I said, he was cooperating. And he was, in the beginning, willing to take a polygraph test until he actually talked to his father. It's kind of at the point, though, like when you kind of go in down the rabbit hole of this case and see all the evidence, it's like, it's hard for me to believe anything that the police say. everyone. Welcome to Crime Family. I'm your co-host, AJ, and I'm here with my two sisters, Stephanie and Katie. And welcome to another deep dive into a infamous true crime case that you're probably familiar with, um, at least a little bit if you follow true crime. And this is the Lacey Peterson murder case. And like I said, if you're a fan of true crime or you follow or you're, you know, didn't live under a rock, I guess, when it was happening, you probably at least know her name and maybe some of the basic details. So over this next four episodes, we're going to do a deep dive into this case, covering everything from the initial disappearance of Lacey to the suspicion of her husband, Scott, who many people still believe did it, to the trial, the verdict, and also some new updates. As, as we've been researching this case, there's been some new developments as well. So we're going to get into all of that. And I guess... Without further ado, we're just going to get right into it because we have a lot of ground to cover. <laughs> so for true crime followers, Lacey Peterson has been a household name for over 20 years. Her murder grabbed the attention of the U.S. and really the world on Christmas Eve 2002. And the media storm that it brought with it was comparable to the O.J. Simpson case or to even the Casey Anthony case that we did last time. So definitely one of those high profile cases. Lacey was born Lacey Denise Rocha on May 4th, 1975. When her parents divorced, she was still quite young, and Lacey, her mom, and her brother moved to Modesto, California. Lacey loved the outdoors and loved being in the garden. That was one of her major pastimes. And so after she graduated from high school, she moved to San Luis Obispo, California, to study horticulture at Polytechnic State University. It was while she was attending this university that she met Scott Peterson. They met at Cafe Pacific, which was a local cafe where a lot of college students would go and he worked there at the time and she would frequent this cafe to study and hang out with friends back in 1994 and meeting him was one of those moments that changed her life as she gave him her phone number they started dating and quickly fell in love after two years of dating Lacey and Scott were married they opened up a restaurant together and when Lacey graduated college they ended up selling the business and they both moved back to Modesto California and Modesto California is where this case takes place so December 24th of 2002, Lacey was 27 years old and at the time was working as a substitute teacher while her husband Scott was a fertilizer salesman. They lived in a beautiful neighborhood in Modesto and it was Christmas Eve and Lacey was eight months pregnant with their first baby, a son who they were going to name Connor. So according to Lacey's family, she put a lot of energy into being the best housewife she could be. She was very excited about the arrival of her baby and had planned a nautical theme for the nursery. And this should have been a happy time for Lacey, Scott, and their entire family. It was the Christmas season, and everyone was really just getting ready for the arrival of their new family member in the new year. 
but Christmas Eve 2002 would become one of the worst days of their lives. At 5.47 p.m. that evening, Ron Gransky, who was Lacey's stepfather, called 911 to report Lacey missing. He said that Lacey had been out for a walk with her dog, but the dog returned home without Lacey. When asked what time Lacey left to walk the dog, this is a detail that no one really knew exactly, except for Scott, who had this story and knew these sorts of details. He says he last saw Lacey that morning at around 9.30 a.m. before he left the house that morning. Now I'm going to go into a little bit more of a detailed breakdown of that morning, according to Scott and some eyewitnesses. Or I guess Katie's going to go into that. So that morning of December 24th, 2002, it seemed like a typical morning for Scott and Lacey. Scott recalls in a police interview later that day that nothing seemed to be out of the ordinary. He says that Lacey gets up early to have breakfast and then he gets out of bed a little bit later around 8 o'clock a.m. They both have a bowl of cereal and they sit down to watch the Martha Stewart show, which was one of Lacey's favorite shows. And Lacey is cleaning up a bit. She's mopping the floor and she was going to take the dog out for a walk at a nearby park, which is something that she did often. And Scott says that he was originally planning to play golf that day, but he decided that it was too cold and was going to go fishing instead. And between 9.20 a.m. and 9.40, an eyewitness claims to see Scott outside loading up umbrellas or loading up something into the back of his truck. And they even say hello to each other. And then Scott says he heads over to his warehouse where he stores his boat. And this is about three miles away from their home. It's reported that between 10.30 and 11 o'clock a.m., Scott is on his computer at his warehouse and he's checking emails and he's looking up some info just about some tools online. And Scott says he then loaded up his boat and he headed over to the Berkeley Marina, which is on the San Francisco Bay, which took about an hour and a half. One of their neighbors on the block named Karen Service she reports seeing the Peterson's dog named Mackenzie still on his leash walking around near the Peterson home. And Karen says she takes the dog and puts him back into Lacey and Scott's yard through the gate. And she recalls this happening around 10.18 a.m. that morning. Now, just before 1 o'clock p.m., Scott parks his truck at the marina and even has a receipt for the parking lot that he is able to provide to police later on. He's out on the boat for about an hour and a half or so and at 2.15 he calls Lacey and tells her that he's leaving the marina. He leaves her a message on the house answering machine and also on her cell phone as she's not picking up either of these lines. Hey, beautiful. I just left a message at home. Uh, 2.15, I live in Berkeley. I won't be able to get to the Villa Farms to get that basket for Papa. I was hoping you would get this message and uh, go on out there. I'll see you in a bit, sweetie. Love you. Bye. End of message. So at around 4.30, Scott drops his boat off at the warehouse, and then he heads home to find their dog, Mackenzie, in the backyard with the leash still attached, but there's no Lacey. And... Scott says that he found it a little bit unusual that the leash would still be on the dog and also that the door was unlocked. Lacey's car was still at the house and he had assumed that maybe Lacey just went over to her mother Sharon's house. So Scott proceeds to have a shower. He puts his clothes in the wash. He heats up some pizza for supper and then he decides to call Sharon at around 517. When he finds out that Lacey is actually not there, it doesn't take long for the worry to take over. And at 5.47pm, like we just said, that's when Lacey's stepfather Ron calls 911 to report Lacey missing. And of course, as we get into, for police, Scott being the spouse to a missing person, he is immediately on their radar as someone to look into further. So one thing that came up when I was doing my research, so I watched, I believe it was ABC's 2020. They did a couple of episodes on this case. I believe this was from 2017. And they interview Lacey's mother, Sharon, in this documentary or this episode of 2020. And she recalls that when Scott calls her and asked if Lacey was with her, she distinctly remembers him saying that Lacey was missing, which was an odd thing for him to say because... Just because she's not at his house or with her mother doesn't mean that she's quote-unquote missing. She could just be with a friend or she could be somewhere else with a 
perfectly reasonable explanation, but he goes to the conclusion that she's missing almost right away. Also, Lacey's car is in the driveway when he gets home, so I guess to him, you know, wherever she went, if she did go out on her own, was either within walking distance from the house or someone else came to pick her up. So those are really the only two options. If there wasn't foul play and he didn't do anything and her car is in the driveway, so she either walked somewhere or got picked up by someone to go somewhere. However, Lacey's keys and her purse were both inside the home. So obviously if she went somewhere, because one thing that came up was he thought maybe that she went to the convenience store to pick up something. They were getting ready for dinner. She maybe just stopped by to get something quickly. But her purse was at the house, so she wasn't going to buy anything there. And also, if you're going to leave the house and go down the street to the convenience store, I mean, you probably would want, would want to lock your house up and you'd bring your keys to do that. Maybe, it, well, maybe it was the car keys, though. It just said keys. So maybe it was the car keys to the car that was there. But her purse was inside, which was the major thing here. And so I actually listened to an episode of a podcast. So the podcast is Rabia and Ellen Solve the Case. And this podcast, of course, features the great Rabia Chowdhury. So you'll know her if you listen to our show from the Adnan Syed case um, that we did, that we covered. Um, she's done the Undisclosed podcast and is really great um, and just does a lot of great work with, with innocence cases and stuff like that. So she has a podcast with, with um, another co-host, Ellen, and they cover this case on this podcast. And so a lot of the stuff I'm going to mention... I will talk about this podcast. I do think they do bring up a lot of great points. So Rabia mentions in this episode, so in other cases where men have killed their partner, so she brings up the Chris Watts case. So if you're a true crime follower, you probably know that case for sure. And she says in cases like the Chris Watts and other cases, the perpetrator is very likely to delay quite significantly before calling the police and alerting other people that the person that they've just killed has gone missing to give as much time as possible for them to get their story straight or to you know, get rid of evidence or stuff like that. So in this case, Scott reportedly returns home around 5 p.m. Like he goes back to his warehouse to drop off the boat. He like that's around, you know, 4 or 4.30. And his house is not that far from his warehouse. So by 5 o'clock, he's home. And he's already calling shortly after that about Lacey's whereabouts. I mean, he calls Sharon and Ron, asks if she's there. So he would have very little time upon his arrival home to actually hide evidence or do the necessary things that one might do if they're just returning home for the first time after killing their wife. You know, things like getting your story straight. You know, you need time to kind of formulate these, these things um, unless you've been thinking about it long in advance. However, in my opinion, so just to play both sides of this argument, you could say that he was making these calls very early on because he and Lacey were expected to go to you know, Sharon and Ron's house for dinner and meet up with family. And it was Christmas time. So this is a time of year when you're going to be seeing people regularly. You're visiting family and friends. So it's going to be very easily noticeable if someone all of a sudden is just not showing up for these events. So you could say that Scott had no choice but to make these calls so early on because like they're supposed to go to their house that night. So he has to keep up appearances and continue to fabricate this story and be like, where is she? She's not here because they're going to find out eventually. But then I think like, if Scott had enough foresight to actually go through that effort to do these little things that would keep his story looking good, wouldn't he also have the foresight to, like, not just kill his partner around Christmas time for that exact reason? Like, what a terrible time for him to do something like this if his intention is for it to not raise suspicions as easily. So I can see both sides. You know, people, you could say he has to keep up appearances, but it's like why wouldn't you do it at a time that's not Christmas when you're not going to be seeing, like people aren't going to be seeing Lacey as regularly throughout the rest of the year as they would at Christmas. You know, you're visiting all these people. So if it was like January, February, or any other time, you could go a couple of days without hearing from Lacey, which might not be unusual, right? So it's just an odd time for him to do something like that if he's also worried about keeping up appearances. So just kind of a thought that I had in all this. Yeah, also thinking that, yeah, it would be, if he was planning it, it would be a weird time for him to do it, like you said, but also could have um, like happened not by accident, but he could have been planning it, but then kind of blew up and just did everything sooner than he thought. But also you'd think that if he did do it, he could have just called like Lacey's family and said she wasn't feeling well, she went to sleep early or something, and so that they weren't going to make it for supper, and that would have given him more time as well. Um, and because she was eight months pregnant, that's a super likely scenario that she just wasn't feeling up for going anywhere. 
So, I mean, he could have done something like that, but he didn't, right? He still was like, where's Lacey right away? So, I don't know. I think that kind of gives him some credit, maybe, if if he is innocent. Yeah, that's true. I guess it would be easy for him to just say, like, she's not feeling well. She went to bed early or something. So, that's a good point, too. So, one thing that did stand out to many people, I mean, is a question that kind of comes up is, you know, Scott says that he was going to go golfing that morning, but the weather was just too cold. So weirdly enough, he decided to go fishing instead, um, which to many people seemed a little weird because he said that if it's too cold to go golfing at a golf club, but not too cold to go fishing in the open water where there's going to be wind. And, you know, you think if it's cold for too cold for one, it's going to be too cold for the other. So, I mean, that does seem a little bit suspicious. What do you guys think of that? Like, that's why that's what I can't get past. Like, why? That doesn't make any sense to me. Like, it's too cold to go golfing. But yet, out in the middle of the ocean, it's going to be warmer. I don't know if he was like, I don't know what he, what his plan was or what his thought in his head was, because that doesn't make any sense to me. Oh, it's cold to, to do anything, then fishing would be the last thing you do. I know. Like, I thought about that too, but then I was thinking, like, well, there's things that I would do in the cold and other things that I wouldn't do because I felt like, oh, it's too cold for that. Like, I mean, if you're in a boat, yes, he's on the water, but he could be like bundled up with his gloves and like a warm coffee or something but if he's golfing maybe he can't wear those bulky gloves because he can't get the swing right and he can't be holding a coffee while he's golfing i don't know just things like that he's on a boat you know he could be wrapped up warm so like those kind of things are what like i think of it's like easier to stay warm maybe rather than when he's golfing i don't know yeah that that's a good point um it's actually interesting you said that because on this podcast as well that robbie and ellen solved the case they do believe like just for you know, FYI. So Robbie and Ellen do believe that Scott Peterson is completely innocent of this crime. And that's the angle they are coming from. So they do bring up this question during their coverage of the case as well. And they mentioned that it's definitely a fair question. Um, and Ellen actually mentions that point too of like, you can be wrapped up in a blanket on the boat and you can have coffee. So it might be a little bit warmer than possibly being out on like the, the open golf course and, and stuff like that. Um, but they also bring up the interesting point that Scott Peterson's father-in-law, Ron Gransky, also went on a solo fishing trip that morning as well. So if Ron is going on that same morning, it's not crazy to think that Scott would too. So just an interesting point that got brought up that I thought was worth mentioning. Yeah, and I know that Scott was like an avid golfer and an avid fisher. Like he did both those things almost his whole life. But maybe, you know, he would just enjoy fishing more, even if it's cold. But if it's um, cold, he doesn't want to, he's not going to enjoy golfing. So you be, yeah, you can pick and choose your activities based on like what's going on so i mean it's not out of the i don't think it's super crazy to think that he decided to go fishing instead but also but also i guess everyone's different but for me it's like if it's too cold to go golfing for me i also wouldn't think oh i'm gonna go fishing instead like cold is cold but i mean i guess that's just my two cents but everyone's different obviously that's what i think if it's too if it's too cold to go golfing i ain't going swim fishing too cold <laughs> but if you're used to that then but also like oh for me it would be like, oh, it's too cold for me just to go outside and go for a walk. But like, oh, maybe we'll, we'll go skating on the pond outside. Like, it's not too cold to do that. Even though that's a winter activity, you know? You're not just going to like not do anything ever because it's cold out. Or, you know, oh, it's too cold for me to like go do this. But I but it's not too cold for me to like go to the store to get snacks. Or like, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Like, just priorities. Yeah. So, yeah. I don't know. Um, And also like... <laughs> One of the things Scott did say was that a big motivation for him going fishing also was that he really wanted to get this boat in the water because it was a new boat. So I guess he just wanted to get it in there. So maybe that kind of like trumped golfing that day because he had like another reason. So yeah, I don't know. There's like endless, I feel like, possibilities of why he chose one over the other. So after the 911 call is placed to report Lacey missing, the Modesto police arrive just minutes later at 6 p.m. and they meet Scott and Sharon at the park. And the detective that was first on the scene was Detective Al Brocchini, and he immediately wanted to take a look around Scott's house, of course. And so they go back to the house, and he starts searching the residence. He searches through all the rooms, and he's looking through drawers, but he doesn't find anything that would immediately stand out to suggest foul play. There's no evidence of forced entry. There's no evidence of a struggle. There's no blood or anything to suggest that anyone was harmed in the Peterson house. And burglary was also ruled out as well as there was nothing missing in, from the house. 
And this wasn't a little search either. So according to the docuseries called The Murder of Lacey Peterson, which was released on A&E in 2017, this was like a seven-hour search of the house and Scott's warehouse. The police searched from around 6.20 p.m. on Christmas Eve to about 1.20 a.m. on Christmas Day. So Detective Brocchini asks Scott to take him to his warehouse because he wants to inspect Scott's boat. And this would obviously be the one that he would have taken out fishing that same day. And the warehouse was located near a strip mall. And they went to go visit late into the night. So like Katie said, they did a nearly seven-hour search of the house and his warehouse. So by the time they're getting making this trip to the warehouse, it's past midnight. Um, and it's also, remember, it's Christmas Eve. And now it's just turned Christmas Day, like early on Christmas Day. So it's already going to be quiet in that area on any night because it's like a strip mall and everything's closed so there's just not a lot of people around but it's also christmas so just keep in mind like this is going to be a very empty part of town everyone's in with their family and in the house so you're just not going to see a lot of people around so that was normal and so scott mentions to detective brocchini that there's no power in the warehouse which the police officer comments he didn't really see as suspicious initially um so scott opens up the door uh, to the warehouse once they get there and the detective kind of drives his car up as close to the door of the warehouse as he can and he shines his headlights in to provide some type of light so the detective takes a few photos of the boat and that's it um, and then when, when making a call to the mid supervisor so i kind of looked up he just says mid and i looked it up it's the modesto irrigation district so i guess they control the the power supply and all that sort of stuff i don't really know the description of what they do but so I'm going to say MID. Um, so the detective calls the MID supervisor to ask about when power would be restored or how long it's been out. And he's shocked to discover that the supervisor tells him that there's no power outage there and everything's fine and has been fine. So already, like, Scott has been caught in a lie by this detective. And why would he tell the detective that there's no power in the warehouse when the MID supervisor confirmed otherwise? And also just an important thing I want to mention is that this was in the ABC 2020 documentary, and it's the detective saying this. And as we'll get into this case, this is kind of a case where the police zero in on someone and there's tunnel vision involved. So just keep in mind that every statement that we're getting from the police is obviously going to fit into their very narrow theory of who they think did it. And so I was watching this and it, it kind of paints a story, but it's all based on the police's narrative because, you know, the 2020 documentary isn't necessarily interviewing people who are on the other side of it. So just keep that in mind as well. And it did come up in this ABC 2020, like this part about the Scott saying there was a power outage, but I didn't really see it come up in many other things. Like even things that were saying Scott was guilty didn't really mention this. So I don't know how much that's important or relevant, but it was kind of an interesting thing that Detective Brocchini mentioned was like the first sort of red flag in his mind that went up. And this was just hours after she was reported missing. Also, though, about that, I don't find that that suspicious because, I mean, the power legit could have been actually out and then just got restored really quickly. Like, I don't know about you guys, but where I live, sometimes the power will go out for like five minutes, come back on. Or sometimes it'll go out for like a couple hours and come back on. Or he could have like blown a switch or blown a fuse or something in his warehouse. It was just him that was affected, but he didn't know that. And so when they look it up, it doesn't. there's no like power outage on the grid. Because maybe it was already fixed or maybe it was just like his local problem. So, I mean, that to me it just seems like super weak. And it's just like, oh my god, look, he lied. So, I would I don't really put much into that. And I actually didn't have another source that mentioned this either. So, I, uh, yeah, Kate, I, I was, you just took, literally took the words out of my mouth. Because I was just going to say, like, I don't believe that. The, I mean, the power could have went out. Like, the, I'm going to say the other day the power went out here randomly and came back on for no reason. It was like a nice day out, so... He does say, like, he called the MID supervisor who said there was enough, there was no record that it had gone out. Like, even if it was a little glitch, you'd think that would still show up on their end that, oh, there was this problem here. Not if he blew, blew a fuse, though. I was going to say, like, if he blew a fuse, then, then it wouldn't show up on the other end. Yeah. And I guess, and like, he didn't really go into when he's telling this story. He didn't really go. And I'm assuming, like, even if Scott says there's no power, you would still go in and, like, turn on the light or try to turn on the light when you enter. So there was no mention of, like, him. He tried to turn on the light and it, he confirmed that it was out. I'm assuming he did because the light didn't go on. So I don't really know like where that all plays into it. But that was just kind of he was describing that this moment to him was like his first 
oh, like when the MID supervisor said there was no record of this and Scott said, that was when the red flag went off to him. So I guess for this one detective, that was the moment where he started to think things were kind of sketchy from Scott. Even I guess from the beginning, though, even though it, maybe it doesn't seem like it, Scott was, for the most part, very cooperative with the police. He willingly sat down with Detective Burkini for an interview at around midnight that night at the police station. And he kind of reiterates what we outlined already about his morning, about what him and Lacey had done and what Lacey's plans were, and then what he did that afternoon. And so, like we already said, the police were looking at Scott very closely from the ver very beginning. And they were always trying to trip him up or catch him in a, in a lie. And the detective asked Scott for details about the show that they were watching that morning. Because Scott had mentioned that they were watching an episode of Martha Stewart. And Scott says that they had that they were doing something with meringue or making meringue cookies on the show. So he just reiterates that he went fishing, tells the detectives Lacey's plans for the day to take the dog for a walk, and then she had planned to go to the store and get supplies for Christmas Day breakfast. And Scott's story was that he said he was going to go fish for sturgeon um, in San Francisco Bay. Um, and this was a huge area, and he had a small little boat, like very, you know, single person or a couple of people. And it didn't really seem suitable for fishing in that big of an area. But anyway, that's what he did. So Lacey's family apparently didn't even know we had a fishing boat. And when Sharon asked him when he bought the boat, Scott wouldn't answer directly, but said that he had bought it as a surprise gift for Lacey's stepdad, Ron. So the circumstances about the specific part of the story was under scrutiny and suspicious right from the beginning. Again, this is from the 2020 documentary where they're interviewing Lacey's family who believe Scott was guilty and the police. So take that for, you know, what it is like. When you have tunnel vision or when you believe something, you're going to kind of have everything fit into that that theory. So I guess the part, the point that he wasn't at, like wouldn't answer when he bought it or why he bought it or whatever was kind of a red flag for, for Sharon initially. And that's what she's saying in this documentary from 2017. So, yeah. So we're going to get into a little bit of the investigation in this case. And there is a lot to go over. So get ready for kind of like just a dump of information. I think it's super interesting though, so we'll get into it and we'll probably have to continue on the investigation um, in the next episode as well. So Scott knew right from the beginning basically that the police were looking at him as the prime suspect and not just because the spouse is always the first one that police point to when someone goes missing, but Scott had actually overheard on the police radio that day. He heard an officer say, quote, the husband is suspicious, end quote. So Scott's guard was likely up from the get-go, and because he knew the police were not only looking at him as standard for seizure, but because they thought he was suspicious, this might be why his demeanor seemed off to them. So as we'll get into, like, police kind of hone in and reiterate multiple times that they just didn't like Scott's demeanor and how he was acting. And like we've heard thousands of times before, in other cases that we've covered or just other cases that are out there, the way someone acts when something like this happens is always under scrutiny, but I feel like there's never a right way to act, especially when the police are looking at you and when the media and the public are looking at you. Like, no matter what you do, they're not going to like it. And so the police thought that Scott was just acting too nonchalant for the situation, but one could speculate that he was maybe acting different than he normally would because he knew the police were suspicious of him and he was trying to act normal but not overdo it it's hard to say um i've heard in this that a and e docuseries his family members kind of talking to scott and they're saying that he comes from a long line of stoic so like stoic is just like you know very um you don't show emotions a lot and so that was kind of like his character trait of scott and his family so it was, wasn't out of the ordinary for maybe scott to just act very calm in this situation, even days later when the police meet up with Scott again, Detective John Bueller recalls that Scott seemed very uninterested in the whole investigation. John says that Scott wasn't asking if they had found anything. He didn't ask what they were doing or even ask anything that you might expect a worried husband to ask about his pregnant wife when she was missing. Yeah, and, and again, the, the police also kind of reiterate this in ABC's 2020. They say they take notice of Scott's demeanor and 
were a bit uncomfortable with his calm and cool demeanor given the circumstances. And both Lacey's mother and stepfather were immediately distraught at the news of her disappearance, of course, as you would. But Scott was definitely not, or at least not by comparison. And like Katie had said, we've talked many times about this before, how nothing you ever do is right in that situation. If you're too emotional, it's, oh, you're crocodile tears, you're, you're a phony. Um, but if you're not emotional enough, then you're cold and you must be the killer. So there's no perfect way, especially when the police are zeroing in on you and every move you make is being criticized. And obviously, as we all know from Tunnel Vision, like Tunnel Vision is a crazy thing and it really makes you focus and you're, that's the point of it. Your Tunnel Vision, you're only looking at something. So when you convince yourself of a certain scenario, then anything will play into that. And I feel like your mind will automatically like, you know, make excuses for why that's happening or make excuses for things that don't fit that narrative and make excuses. Oh, like that's not relevant because of this. So that's very important here as well. So I just want to actually quickly guys ask you guys, like what's your initial thought of like his, of Scott's story from that day and the immediate details that he provided about, you know, Lacey walking her dog and him going fishing. Like what were your initial thoughts about that part of it? Did you think that that story seemed legitimate, at least on the surface? Yeah, I believe the story. I feel like it's a legit story. Like, I know, well, I don't, well, I don't know, but I'm assuming, like, when I was pregnant, like, I like to get out, go for a walk, get moving and stuff, so, I mean, she could have went for a walk, and he could have went fishing. I'm, like, when I first heard of that, like, that doesn't seem like a plausible, or it seems like a plausible, like, thing that happened. Yeah, and you never hear of Scott, like, changing his story about little details that happened. He seems very consistent every time. And I don't know. I'm just going to put this out there. This might be like unpopular opinion, but I don't know how you guys feel. But I don't, I'm not convinced that he's guilty. Like I'm kind of erring on the side of like, I don't think he actually did it. So to me, he seems Thank super you for credible. I was going to say that. <laughs> okay. Like, yeah. Oh yeah, I, I agree. People are going to hate me. Like, don't come at me. Do not. Okay. Me. Yeah. Okay. I so agree. we could all agree on this time. Yeah. Okay. That, yeah. I'm like, we, I'd. I don't think he I don't think he did because he never changed his he never changed his story. I know. And yeah. And there's nothing in the house. There's, we'll get into all that later in the trial, but I'm just saying like doesn't seem to be nothing and the police are just because he's the husband, they're honing in on on him because that's what they do. As you know, exactly. They they take one person. But she could have it could have been any like I don't want to speculate, but it could have been somebody else. She could have been out walking and something could happen to her. Like, Oh, yeah. There's lots of theories that come up that we're going to get into. Like, I was supposed to like, for the dog to come back without the, with his leash on without her doesn't strike me as the husband did it. Because that dog thing doesn't make any sense. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good point. And like that neighbor legit said she found the dog wandering around with the leash on. So like. Why would that be if, you know, if he did something? Um, yeah, I, I, I agree with you guys. I Yeah, it's interesting. This is the first time I'm hearing your guys' opinion because we obviously have researched this case like on our own. So this is the first time I'm hearing. But yeah, I, I agree that I really don't think he's guilty. I I um obviously knew a little about this case, but not, of course, in this much depth. And I was kind of like kind of maybe more on the side of like he did it just based on the evidence that was presented but obviously that was one-sided because you're if you listen to the police or her family who believe that he did it and stuff so yeah good to know you guys also are on the same page so we can get into that um and there's lots of so far we've only scratched the surface of like witness or eyewitness reports about like Lacey walking her dog and all that stuff so we've kind of like just like said that quickly early, but we are going to get into much more detail about the various witnesses that come forward. So there's a lot to get into in this case. So just want to also preface it with that. Like we're going to circle back to a lot of these things. Yeah. And back when this was like actually happening, if you were just listening to what the media had to say, like they painted Scott as a villain, like instantly. And so a lot of people were just convinced that he had done it without even hearing the other side of it. Um, And so that I think it's very easy to be like, yeah, he did it. And then never change your mind if you don't are open minded and like kind of go in farther like we did. So, um, yeah. So I think it's interesting that we all agree on this one, which is good, I think. Yeah. But also, as also, I guess the fact fact, too, that they sort of like hinged on early on was like the fact that he came home and like 
put his clothes in the wash and ate pizza and stuff before he had started calling people. So, I mean, that's one thing that I guess maybe you can say, like, is kind of weird, but also, I mean, there's lots of things in this case you can say are kind of weird, or maybe he didn't act perfectly that a rational person would do, but I don't know. Maybe, but I mean, why Why is it that weird that he comes home and makes himself supper just because his wife's not there? He just has to be like, oh my God, where are you? Like, it would kind of feel, I don't know, I think it'd be more suspicious if he came home and immediately was like, holy shit, my wife's gone. You know what I mean? He was mm-hmm. like, okay, Lacey's not here. She could have went somewhere. I'm going to go about my day like I normally would. And then, you know, when then when he finds out that she's missing, that's when he kind of freaks out. But I don't know. I don't think it's that weird. Like, Steph, if you, I don't know, like if I come home and someone's not here, I'm not going to be like, holy crap. No, like, I was going to say, like, if he came home and, like, noticed she wasn't there, like, maybe he thought maybe she went over to his parents' house early to start prepping or whatever because they were having dinner like yeah that is what he thought i think that's why he called over there so but there was also something and i don't know if we do get into this but when he does get home he checks the voicemails one of which was his own voicemail that he had left for Lacey when he called the house and then another voicemail was from ron who had called and said can you get whipped cream can you pick up some whipped cream we don't have any so i guess for the dinner so maybe he thought when he heard that like oh she maybe she went out to go to the convenience store quickly to buy this whipped cream if she got this message but like i said earlier her purse was in the house so like if she's gonna go buy something you kind of would need that not if you just grabbed your wallet no i guess that's true. like did they did they say what was in the purse just as a purse it could have been an empty purse <laughs> yeah that's what i was thinking too or she could just grab her sometimes i just take my credit card and like don't i don't i don't need the hassle of carrying that big thing around so i don't know it's not i don't think it's super unusual but then when, why would the dog be like outside with the leash still attached though if she's walked out to the that's what I'm, that's what i'm saying yeah that'd be a weird thing to think of like oh i have to cover my tracks i'm gonna let the dog go with the leash on like i just don't think that's something you would think of right so um, yeah maybe the dog got away maybe he was tied outside and he got a, got loose no i mean and as we'll get into like part of the police's theory is like that scott is this master genius who's like putting all these little pieces like laying these like little kind of planning it out but like being really smart about like doing certain things and like so that's kind of their thing is like he's premeditating all this stuff and planting these little seeds early on to kind of bolster his story so we'll get into that like i said before but just interesting how quickly they focused on him the hint the media and the police um when when you just look at his story from like basic fact i mean everything seems pretty legit so far that we've covered at least so it's just crazy that they turned on him so quickly yeah, it is crazy that they turned on him so quickly. But like I said, he was cooperating almost completely with the police from day one. And even so, yeah, he even went down and got that interview that night. And he was in the beginning willing to take a polygraph test until he actually talked to his father, who was like, whatever you do, don't take the polygraph. And Scott's father, Lee Peterson, he actually said that he said this because he kind of knew how the police used those kinds of things. And he said that if he took the test and there was anything that came up that was against him, you know, they would use it against him. But if it came up and he it showed that he wasn't actually lying, then they'd probably disregard that and then not do anything with the results. So like we've heard other times before, it's just polygraph really doesn't do anything to help you if the police think you're guilty they're going to use it against you rather than use it to help you never take never take a polygraph test basically i'm saying like if i'm a suspect yeah i've never taken one so (laughs) because like it never turns out good i feel i know i feel the same i think i'd be like so nervous and like just i don't know it, it just nothing good can come from them i don't think and you can't use them in court anyway so what's the point yeah exactly it's just it it really is just for the police to be like oh you lied about this or you were super nervous here so you're definitely guilty so it's just for them a thing for them to use against you and and it's a manipulation tactic too like they can lie about the results like you can pass it with flying colors and they could still come back and say no you lied and here's all the reasons and then get them nervous and make them second guess themselves so it's all manipulation police are whack so <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Crazy goes off the deep end. <laughs> it's true. It's true. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so I guess, and to further, to further the police's side eye on Scott, they recall that when they were in his home searching, one of the detectives had a glass of water and apparently Scott immediately brought over a coaster so that there wouldn't be a water ring on the table. And when Detective Brocchini was looking through the vehicles, 
He opened one of the doors and it slightly hit the other parked car that was right beside it. And apparently Scott was right over there with a glove so that the paint wouldn't get chipped on the other vehicle. And I've heard some people suggest that Scott was acting like this because he wanted things to know, you know, still be in good condition when Lacey did come back because he felt that they would find her alive. Um, but of course, many think that he was just worried about the wrong thing in this situation. Like, why worry about shipped paint on your car when your wife and unborn son are missing? So different things about his kind of behavior there, which are kind of weird. So the search for Lacey in the days following her disappearance were extensive. Police and many volunteers turned up to assist. There was people on foot, on horseback, and on boats out looking. They were putting up flyers, looking at maps to coordinate search efforts. And all of this was taking place just days after Christmas. So people were really affected by her disappearance. You know, when they're supposed to be spending time with their family, they were actually out searching for Lacey. And even people that didn't know Lacey personally, they felt that they needed to help out and try and bring her home safely. And so a tip line was set up and police received thousands of tips by telephone and one thing was that a lot of people were saying that they had seen Lacey walking the dog on the morning of Christmas Eve, just as Scott had said she was planning to do. And this was brought up in the a e docuseries that police actually were not following up on a lot of tips that were coming in for whatever reason. They don't really go into a lot of detail as to why they weren't, but I mean, some people were thinking that maybe some of the tips were just too vague, maybe... The tipsters were anonymous, so they just didn't have a way to follow up with them. A lot of people think it was because the police had severe tunnel vision. And so a tip that didn't agree with what they thought, they just disregarded. And, you know, maybe there was a good reason why they focused intently on Scott. Or maybe they really just felt like, you know, Scott was their guy. Let's just only look at things that relate to him. And so... Two days after the original search of the Peterson home, police returned on December 26th with another search warrant, and this time they wanted Scott to consent in writing, so they wanted his signature on the search warrant. And Scott had been advised to consult an attorney before he signed anything. And Scott's sister-in-law, Janie Peterson, she tells this docuseries that Scott wasn't concerned about the search of his home. He was more concerned about what the implications were for his signature being on that document. So maybe he was thinking, you know, it could be used against him somehow. Maybe there was like a bunch of legal jargon in the document that he didn't understand. And so he didn't want to consent and sign a document without fully understanding it, which totally makes sense. I mean, especially in, you know, this murder case, what what does your signature on this document really mean? And Scott wasn't able to talk to an attorney in time, so the police just went ahead and executed that search warrant that night anyway. And Detective John Bueller recalls that that particular search warrant wasn't necessarily to look for evidence, but it was partly to just observe Scott's behavior and his demeanor towards the police. And of course, the fact that Scott did not agree to the second search of his home, the police saw that as a red flag. And I guess... If you have nothing to hide, then don't act like you have something to hide. But I'm not sure that Scott, that's how Scott was acting. He was just cautious about, you know, signing this legal document in the middle of a murder investigation. So I, I can kind of see both ways, both sides here. Yeah, like I think you never want to add fuel to the fire. I mean, maybe he didn't know the level to which the police were honing in on him. But, and I guess anything he does is going to add fuel to their narrative. So I guess it's doesn't really matter but that's something too that's going to really add to that narrative of oh he's not cooperating or he has something to hide so i definitely like can see that maybe he should have just let them but also i can understand like no you have a right to look at a document before you sign it like just because they're the police doesn't mean you have no say in the matter yeah exactly and like we've seen what happens sometimes if you fully cooperate with police like i'm thinking like just jeffrey deskovic off the top of my head like he did everything he could to help them and they were like okay haha we got ya And so, I mean, I don't know how much Scott was thinking about this, but, you know, he was definitely being cautious, which I think is a good plan. Yeah. Yeah. And like, so I don't think, I mean, it probably just annoyed the police that he wasn't, you know, that he was putting up any sort of, or asking them questions or putting any sort of resistance to them just handing him a document. 
Um, but like you said, it was they were partially there just to exert, observe his behavior, not necessarily to do a thorough search of the house, which they had already done earlier, of course, the, the night that she was reported missing. And I also think they wanted to just see if he would allow them to to search before presenting him with the official warrant. So I definitely think that they were kind of playing that game with him, just kind of seeing how willing he would be to just let them do whatever. Because obviously any bit of pushback, they can just say like, oh, he's in co- uncooperative, which is annoying. But I feel like that he knows they're there and he knows that they're kind of watching him. Like he's not going to act even like if let's say he did it or if he did it, he's not going to act suspicious. He's not going to because he knows they're that's what they're looking for. So he's going to be like, try not to well, do anything that's going to be suspicious. Do you know what I mean? Like if I know somebody's watching me, then I'm not going to. Well, I mean, not, not necessarily. I mean, I think of the Chris Watts case. If you know anything about that case, I mean, the police were there and the body cam. Sh- he was doing everything and it looks very suspicious. So. I don't know. Yeah, that's what that's what comes to my mind too when I think about this. Like the ways that Chris Watts was acting, you're just like, oh my god, this guy is so stressed out, and you, but you just don't see that from Scott. So yeah. And so, uh, in the uh, ABC 2020 episode, um, Al uh, Brocchini remembers Scott asking him at that time when they presented him with you know this document to sign and all that stuff. Um, there he remembers Scott said, "quote Where's the trust, Al?" end quote um so that was of course a a big red flag of like why would he say this this is crazy it's kind of at the point though like when you kind of go in down the rabbit hole of this case and see all the evidence it's like it's hard for me to believe what anything that the police say so just because this police officer al brocchini is saying this on 2020 that scott said that i mean i don't know if i really believe that or it's easy for them to spin it so he says that you know he was saying like where's the trust al um which was a red flag for him. But like I said, anything could be a red flag when you when you look hard enough for it. So as you'll see is with the theme of this case is like everything Scott does is scrutinized and, and the police are really kind of onto him. And we're going to go more in depth about all the crazy ways in which they catch him in lies. They think they do or all the red flags and stuff. So we're going to end part one here. I think that's good for just going over her initial disappearance and what the police think of Scott, at least initially. Um, So we're going to end part one here and we hope you will join us next week for part two, where we're going to go more in depth, of course, follow continuing to follow the investigation as it rolls out and a shocking revelation about Scott's life that he had been keeping secret from everyone. Um, So we're going to get into that shocking revelation as well. And it's, yeah, just a lot more to cover. It's a huge case. So we're going to try to get through it um, and talk about as much as we can about it. So. Thank you so much for for joining us for part one. We hope you enjoyed it uh, so far. We're on Instagram at Crime Family Podcast. We're on X at Crime Family Pod One, and on Facebook at Crime Family Podcast. You can also subscribe to our channel on YouTube. We have all of our episodes there for you to listen to. You can become a patron of the show if you'd like as well, and buy merch um, at, at at the link. We'll have all that in the show notes. So definitely engage with us as well. Like send us emails, Crime Family Podcast at gmail and engage with us give us your thoughts on this case and previous cases uh we'd love to hear from you and what you think of the show so yeah follow us on socials and uh interact with us because we'd love to hear from you so thank you so much we'll be back next week for part two of the Lacey peterson murder case and uh yeah until then take care bye bye bye